Welcome everybody to this presentation on eTherapy Ethics 2022. I'm your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. In this presentation, we're going to identify differences between e-therapy and face-to-face -face counseling, discuss the pros and cons of e-therapy, discuss issues with confidentiality using e-therapy or any sort of technology, explore issues related to boundaries, dual relationships, and social networking, review various ethical codes as they relate to e-therapy. We'll talk about something called disinhibition and finally wrap up looking at some common ethical violations in e-therapy. Since the, since 2020, e-therapy has become much more mainstream. I found when I was updating this presentation that many of the state boards that used to either prohibit or greatly restrict what they considered ethical for e-therapy, they've changed their codes and guidelines, which I think is really interesting and awesome, but we also need to, as we were talking about in the, in the last presentation, uh, not assume that e-therapy is right for everybody and not assume that every type of e-therapy is right for everybody. State laws and board regu regulations still do vary considerably regarding who can practice independently and what is required for e-therapy. Some states require that insurance reimburse for e-therapy at the same rate as face-to-face. -face. Uh, right now, as I said, to the best of my knowledge, and I didn't go through every single state, but the, all the states that I looked at, uh, e-therapy was allowed in that state. However, you need to be licensed in the state in which you are residing. So if you're in Tennessee, you need to be uh, licensed in Tennessee and licensed in the state in which your client is uh, and not necessarily residing. So that, that's kind of an interesting little ethical caveat there because some of us have clients who, for example, live half the year in one state and the other half the year in another state. And unless you're licensed in both states, then you may only be able to provide services ethically and legally for half the year. So that, that's an important consideration. The American Counseling Association and others have been working really, really hard over the past couple of years to put together something called the Counseling Compact. And what the Counseling Compact will do uh, eventually will allow people to more easily get approved to practice in different states. So you have to be licensed in your particular state, but it will be easier to get reciprocal licensure or approved to practice in other states that are a part of the compact. All of the language hasn't been worked out yet, but they do have enough states that have signed on that they are in the process of starting to get together their delegations and begin working on the wording. So they're hoping in the next 18 months or so that the counseling compact might actually come to fruition, which would be very, very awesome. Privacy laws and policies vary between states and entities as well. So you need to know, as we we're talking about in, in uh, the pr presentation on general ethics, you need to know what the laws and policies are, for example, for mandatory reporting, for confidentiality, for uh, notifying partners of people who have communicable diseases. There are some things that are allowed in some states and not others. Ethical codes and e-therapy. There are dozens of them out there. It's important to know who you are governed by. If you're a social worker, you're going to look at the NASW codes. If you're a counselor, you're going to look at the ACA and or NBCC codes. A psychologist, you know, the list goes on. Uh, we're not going to go, I'm not going to sit here and explain each one of these codes to you in particular. We're going to just summarize the ethical 
issues that we need to consider in e-therapy in this presentation. But I did include them in the PowerPoint and in the PDF that's in the classroom if you signed up to take CEUs. So you can go and look at each one of these and inform yourself about what the regulations are. For example, ISMHO has suggested principles for the online provision of mental health services. And they are very articulate in the things that need to be done and for example the things that need to be included in a informed consent for e-therapy which is very different than a regular old informed consent for treatment tip 60 from SAMHSA the substance abuse and mental health services administration goes over the research on using technology-based therapeutic tools in behavioral health some of it is specifically e-therapy like you would think about and other parts of the tip talk about using things like virtual reality and some other internet-based or technology-based tools that can be really effective for people to use either in session or between sessions in order to um, move towards their therapeutic goals and then HIPAA and when it comes to technology-based counseling, you have to be aware of not only HIPAA, which most of us know, but also high tech and HIPAA and high tech govern what you need to consider when guarding the confidentiality and privacy of the clients with whom you are engaging virtually and it's recommended ethically. This is another one of those ethical things. If for example, you say, hey Jim Bob you know that's my favorite client hey Jim Bob I think it would be great for you to create a collage that represents whatever you can do it in this particular um, at this particular website and I'm going to use Canva for example because a lot of people are familiar um, it's important to let Jim Bob know that Canva is not HIPAA compliant they don't have to be and if you're recommending them do something that may be sensitive uh, it may not be advisable to recommend that they do it in something that is not using HIPAA compliant software and we'll talk about some ways around that later such as using programs that are installed on their computer and air gapped for example but we do need to be aware of that and not only for our our personal interactions but also for anything else that we recommend to to clients benefits of e-therapy you can access experts on a particular problem in a greater area that doesn't mean you can access them internationally or worldwide unless that person happens to be licensed in your state as well uh, for those of you who are residing in the US but it does for example allow people in Sparta Tennessee to access clinicians in Nashville or Knoxville or uh, Memphis or Chattanooga uh, so they have a greater chance of being able to connect with a therapist that has some specialized skills that may not be um, readily available in the area you also have access to a greater number of therapists uh, as I mentioned uh, before that right now every therapist I know as soon as they open a slot in their schedule it gets filled there are more people needing services than there are therapists available if you're in a small area like Sparta Tennessee for example I like Sparta I'm not trying to pick on them I love rural areas but uh, there aren't nearly as many face-to-face -face therapists in that area so if somebody needs treatment they may need to consider reaching out to a therapist that is in in Lebanon or in uh, Cookville or Crossville or somewhere else that where there's a greater population density e-therapy can be more cost effective for the practitioner and therefore the patient 
there are certain guidelines that we've got to follow there are certain precautions we've got to take to be HIPAA and high tech compliant but in most cases it's still far far less expensive than having to pay for a brick and mortar for a lease on a brick and mortar building and the utilities for that building and everything else that goes along with that it's more convenient most people have can access e-therapy services with a DSL connection and a $15 webcam and some of you may be going what is a DSL connection that is a lower bandwidth connection than most people actually have right now but it's important to recognize that uh, that is the mi kind of the minimum that's needed in order to provide effective e-therapy if you're providing video counseling and the connection is too slow then you're not getting real-time feedback on nonverbals. so for example I am broadcasting through YouTube right now and there is a huge lag between what you're hearing and what I'm saying I think it's a little bit over a minute that would not be ideal for therapy because you need to be able to see nonverbals in real time and hear verbals in real time likewise a jumpy connection is not going to be very helpful either so both parties need to have a stable connection and a minimum minimally useful webcam now you can use some people do prefer to use their mobile device and that's fine you don't need a separate webcam you can just use the built-in uh, video camera however it's a lot more convenient to do that from their home for example than it is to do it from to have to drive to a therapist's office find a parking space go in wait um, after the therapist appointment they have to go back to their car they have to drive back to wherever an hour therapy appointment can easily add up to two or three hours of lost time and potential uh, two or three hours of time they're having to pay for a babysitter or something else that's another benefit of e-therapy there's a wider range of available business hours if you can find somebody for example in Colorado who is licensed in your state if you live in Florida then they're since they're on a different time zone you may be able to interact with them later than you would somebody who is in the state in which you are residing in it provides a degree of anonymity now with e-therapy we don't it, it's definitely not encouraged to have somebody remain anonymous we have to have the informed consent we have to know that they're over 18 we have to know who we're talking to uh, but it prevents people from having to walk into a waiting room where three of their neighbors might be sitting it prevents people from having to park their car outside a clinic that their friends drive by and may see and recognize their car so for some people that is comforting to not have to worry about running into somebody they know research has indicated that people are generally more open when they're in their comfort zone they are not feeling like they are a you know a lab rat on on display think about when you go to the doctor's office I'm not talking about a therapist I'm talking about the doctor's office are you as relaxed and open when you're at the doctor's office as you are when you're at home for a lot of us the answer is no uh, a therapist's office we try to make them as homey and relaxing and welcoming as possible but you're still in somebody else's space and for some people it may make them more tense other people may have the exact opposite reaction they're like my kids aren't around my spouse isn't around my dogs aren't around nobody can hear anything I say except for my therapist so I can actually be more open you need to talk about it with the th with the client what they feel most comfortable with 
And it is great for people who can't leave their homes or have no transportation. That's a great point. According to Tip 60 from SAMHSA, many youth now prefer e-therapy. They've grown up with a mobile device in their hand and they prefer to interact with people via video chat or sometimes text chat. A lot of therapists are not comfortable with 100% commitment to e-therapy, but they may use techno technological means, technological interventions as a therapist extender. For example, online journals or, and they do make some now that are HIPAA compliant, that people can record their feelings, their mood states, what have you. And it actually gets transmitted to the therapist every time they enter a, put in a journal entry. So those services are out there. They're a little pricey, but they are out there if you're in a uh, situation where that seems like it would be a helpful cost. Drawbacks to e-therapy. Setup takes some cost and technical know-how. Now, since 2020, a lot of the services online, a lot of the places that you can sign up for uh, have streamlined the process so it is pretty easy. The biggest thing that you need to know is that you have to have, underscore, have to have a business associate agreement signed with any organization that you use for example for calendaring or uh, providing e-therapy services you also need to have that stable inter internet connection and a good camera you must be thoroughly familiar with the hipaa and high tech act and it takes a minute it's kind of dry reading but there are a lot of HIPAA and High Tech Act violations that make e-therapy seem less professional. We do need to be aware of that. We don't want people thinking that, oh, my therapist is you know, doing e-therapy so they can you know, do sessions and get paid while they're cooking their dinner or something. That's not okay. With e-therapy, it can be more difficult to handle crises and identify when somebody is decompensating cognitively or emotionally. It's also more difficult to identify, for example, if they're under the influence of a particular substance. You can't smell it on them. You may not be seeing them walk around to observe their gait. So there are some things that you're going to miss. Some people argue that accurate assessments can't be done virtually. A lot of that has disappeared. As I said, when I went and I looked at the ethical codes of the particular boards that were prohibitive before, those clauses have disappeared, which I think is really good. However, a lot of the boards and ethical guidelines indicate things like assessments for certain uh, must be done with a vi with video capability or in real life. We want to be able to see the whole person. An email assessment, a text-based assessment doesn't give you near the amount of information. So ethically, most boards recommend and some require that the initial assessment session uh, be done in some sort of either IRL face-to-face -face environment or a video based environment all modes of e-therapy can be captured and redistributed it's important to recognize this somebody can have a screen capture running on their computer while you are talking to them and they can capture the whole session well you th you say well it's their session they can do with it what you what they want yes they can but you are also part of that session Likewise, if you're doing group, if you're hosting a group chat on a platform, people can screen capture that or whether it's screen capturing a video or screen capturing a, an image and things can be taken out of context or confidentiality can be broken 
when this happens. So you need to consider what exactly might be happening here. In cases of domestic violence, there are unique challenges. In domestic violence situations, it's not uncommon for the perpetrator to have installed key loggers or other information on the computer, which means it's really, really important that the victim be aware that it may not be safe to be communicating virtually. We don't know if there are hidden cameras in their home. We don't know if there are key loggers. <clears throat> we don't know um, if the perpetrator is maintaining a log of their internet history. So it is really important that we emphasize the safety aspect or the safety drawbacks uh, to e-therapy for somebody that is in an unsafe situation. And e-therapy is not as effective, according to Tip 60, uh, it is not as effective with cultures that use high context communication. Some of that can be ameliorated if you're using video, especially if you back away from the camera and you're getting more of a full body picture. But high context communication cultures place an emphasis on nonverbal communication. So if you're missing the nonverbals or if they're out of sync, you're going to miss a lot if you're just going with what is verbally articulated. <clears throat> Mon <coughs> Excuse me. Monitoring. If you're using e-therapy, it's really important to monitor technology and intervention usage rates. Maybe you offer e-therapy, but nobody wants to use it. Or you offer this particular tool that you think is great. Maybe it's one of those journaling tools, but people are not using it or only sporadically using it. Well, it's important to consider that, not only from a financial standpoint, because why pay for it if nobody's using it, but also to get curious and ask, I wonder why? What is it about this tool or this format that my particular client base either doesn't like or doesn't feel comfortable with? That all goes along with ethics. We may find that the particular population that you work with is just not comfortable online. We need to monitor the demographic characteristics of our clients and be aware of differences. For example, my husband's grandparents are older and they have a lot of difficulty doing very basic things on what we would consider very basic things on the internet. Downloading and installing programs and setting up a video chat can be really stressful and overwhelming for them. So if your clients are in a particular demographic where e-therapy is intimidating or adds more stress, you may not want to do it. If on the other hand, your client base is preferring e-therapy, that might be something to add. For example, if they are homebound or if they are, uh, have no transportation or if they're in a rural area, when I worked in Florida, one of the uh, counties that we served, and it was about an hour away from Gainesville. So, and, and most people think Gainesville is kind of rural, but it was about an hour away from Gainesville. The entire county had a population of something like 15,000 people at, at that time. The entire county. And coming to a place where there was available and accessible services was really difficult. Uh, so if you have people who are in a rural area, for example, and getting to your office is an hour drive each way, e-therapy might make sense. You want to look at retention and satisfaction rates. You may love e-therapy, but if your clients are dropping out, we need to, or you need to examine why. Is it the e-therapy modality? 
or is it something else? Look at staff satisfaction. Oh my gosh, this is a biggie. Not just with e-therapy, for example, video chat, which I think a lot of us have gotten used to, but staff, staff satisfaction with other technology-based tools like electronic medical records. That can add or remove a lot of stress from the staff. A lot of electronic medical records are extremely um, detail oriented. We'll say that cumbersome. Let, let's just call it what it is. And for a lot of people switching electronic med electronic medical records can be an extremely daunting process and it may contribute to a lot of staff burnout. It may contribute to a lot of charting errors. So you need to examine that. Explore your equipment malfunctioning rates and downtime. If you're using video chat, for example, how often does your internet go down? How often does the service you're using go down? Maybe your internet's just fine, but XYZ service that you use for conducting the chat goes down twice a month. Well, that's not very good. You want to examine the cost of care and cost offsets. How much is it costing you to provide this? Are you recouping it? And or if you're saving money, are you considering whether to pass that on to the prospective client? What are the rates of referral? If your referrals are dropping, that indicates sentiments probably lower. So you want to examine why that is. And this goes, this is business practices, but you also want to consider it as part of ethics. Are you, because when you provide e-therapy services, if people are unhappy or don't feel that they're getting good quality services, um, they're dropping out. So non-malfeasance, are you doing harm to your clients? Are you providing them fidelity? Are you providing them high quality services? If not, then your rates of referral may, may go down. People may not experience changes in symptoms or improvements nearly as quickly. On the other hand, it may be great and it may work out better for you to do e-therapy. It's very, very dependent not only on your client base, but also on you as a clinician and how comfortable you are in that modality. Considerations for appropriateness. Not everybody's appropriate. As I mentioned, there are some recommendations out there that people in uh, domestically violent situations, it is likely too dangerous for them to engage in virtual therapy because of the risk of all of the aforementioned issues. But in considering appropriateness, what is the client's level of comfort, preference for, and access to technology? Now I said you have to have at least a, DS, a stable DSL connection. Not everybody has that. And I know some of you who are in big cities are going, what? Yeah, not everybody has that. Um, out where we live, which is 30 miles outside of Nashville, uh, we still don't have a great stable connection out at the farm. What is the individual's cognitive capacity and maturity? It's not likely that e-therapy is going to be appropriate with a five-year-old or even necessarily with a 10-year-old. Um, you know, once you start getting up into the tween and teen stages, it gets a little bit more um, questionable about whether it's better or worse. But you do need to consider what are you able to do. Past and current medical and behavioral health diagnoses, including psychosis. If the person has a history of multiple psychotic episodes, or if they have a history of other physical conditions that may need to be monitored in real life, substance use, eating disorders, uh, other things, then is e-therapy as a standalone modality appropriate? It may be effective for like every other session or something, 
but is e-therapy as a standalone modality appropriate for that client and for clients who uh, do have a relapse into a psychotic episode for example or a manic episode maybe you have a contract or an agreement with that person that when you're in a manic episode you need to come into the office you need to be seen face to face when you're not in a manic episode then we can do online counseling and that's going to be something that you need to negotiate with each person how good are their communication skills if they have difficulty typing my old boss to this day is a two-finger typer and if he were having to type to communicate it would be agonizingly slow and it wouldn't be a good use of his money we wouldn't get much accomplished in an hour video chat on the other hand is you can generally do in real time but they need to be able to communicate verbally what is the client support system do they have people that can be there for them remember if they're in your office and they get triggered and start to decompensate they are right there and it is much easier to implement safety protocols if they are in their house 15 miles away or 150 miles away it's going to take more time and be more difficult to help them get to a place of safety whether it means bringing people in to sit with them or helping them get to uh, involuntary commitment whatever the case is but knowing the client support system is going to be very important when I work with clients who have trauma and I do any sort of virtual counseling with them I want to know that they have somebody local that they can call I want to know that there is someone there that can be there within five minutes if necessary or that we have a plan so they can access help within five minutes should they start to get uh, should they start to decompensate and if the person has a history of violence or self-injurious behavior you really need to consider the appropriateness of standalone e-therapy and the methods that you use as I mentioned a couple of times already video based e-therapy provides you a whole lot more information than text-based or email-based e-therapy appropriate clients there is a lot of research out there and I'm not saying these are the only diagnoses that are appropriate but I am saying there is research-based evidence that e-therapy can be very effective with people who have generalized anxiety disorder depression postpartum depression obsessive compulsive disorder PTSD seasonal affective disorder binge eating disorder and even substance abuse yeah I know I said substance abuse you might want to be able to monitor however it is possible if you have a substance abuse client who you're seeing virtually uh, to require for example that they go to a testing center periodically as you determine you tell them all right with it I need you to go get a drug test done and it needs to be done within the next eight hours at this clinic and they need to go have it done now that can get pretty pricey for people but that is one way of monitoring uh, substance use you have to consider where the person is in their recovery process are they like two days out of detox or have they been clean for 90 days or more and make that ethical call legally you can see them ethically what is in the best interest of the client according to ISHMO and NBCC all of the following must be part of the informed consent for telehealth services and I'm going to go through these really quickly but I think it's interesting to note how different it is from a regular informed consent you must include a, a paragraph about the possibility of misunderstandings 
particularly with text-based forms of e-therapy, whether it is actual like SMS type text or email based text, there can be a lot of misunderstandings because you don't have those nonverbals. You don't have the nuances. Cultural and or language differences that may affect the delivery of services. The increased response time involved in asynchronous forms of communication and your average response time. So if you typically see a person face to face once a month, and then they email with you the other three weeks a month, just kind of throwing out a scenario. How long should they wait between sending you that email and expecting a response? Or if you text with them, how long should they, should they expect to wait? Is it 15 minutes? Is it one business day? How, what is the lag time? between when they reach out and when you're actually going to respond to them. Make sure that they know about time zone differences. Ugh, those daggum time zones trip me up every time. Um, but it is important to know that and make sure you're stating we will have our appointment at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 1 p.m. Central Standard Time and that the client acknowledges that. Outlook, for example, is really good about converting the times for you, um, but not every email compliant, or I'm sorry, HIPAA compliant email service or calendaring service is as good about that. If you're talking verbally with the client, it's recommended that you identify the appointment time in that person's time zone. So I'm in CST, for example, but if I'm seeing somebody in Florida, they're in EST. So I would say, I will see you next week at 1 p.m. Eastern. Does that work for you? So they know exactly what time I'm talking about. Social media policy and the counselor's right to privacy and the possibility of restrictions on the use of any communication with the practitioner needs to be stated. This pre prevents misunderstandings. It's important to make sure that the person knows that you will not be friending them on social media. You will not be going to, to their pages and liking their photos or liking their comments. Posting on their social media and expecting you to read it is not, not appropriate. Um, and that's a whole other ethical issue that uh, is of debate, but generally the consensus is not only do we not, not want people um, looking us up and trying to find out, about, find out about all of our stuff, we should not be, without permission or without a direct request from the client, going and digging into all of their social media because that's kind of an invasion of privacy. A client may request that you evaluate, for example, um, how they're presenting themselves. Maybe they are getting a lot of negative feedback about something. That's gonna be taken on an individual case-by-case -case basis. However, this phrase or this paragraph allows you to let clients know that, hey, if you start messaging me on Facebook, I may block you or Instagram or whatever social media it happens to be um, for that person. You need to have in the informed consent counseling credentials, a physical location of your practice, and contact information for you. Now why the physical location? If they're virtual, why is that important? Because generally that's where the records are stored at and that's where they'll have to go or send a letter to in order to request their, a copy of their records. You need to provide in the informed consent alternatives to receiving, receiving assistance via e-therapy. Just like we're required to provide alternative tr treatment in a regular um, informed consent. You need to let the person know about internet and data security practices, including how to clear their cash and cookies after the session. Now I have yet 
to be brutally honest, I have yet to run into a therapist that actually has this in the informed consent procedures. They need to know how to be able to do that. A lot of therapists don't even know how to do this for themselves. So learn how to clear your cash and your cookies. You need to alert them. Even though a lot of people already know, you do need to alert them to the dangers of entering private information when using a public access or a computer that is on a shared network. A phrase needs to be in there that helps the person recognize the need to check employers policies relating to the use of work computers for personal communications. A lot of times work computers, you can't go in and clear your cash and that information is monitored. So that may be a violation of your confidentiality because the entire IT department has access to it. And there may be a prohibition, a flat out prohibition about using office ba work based computers or the network at work for personal use. So that would mean even if you went out into your car in the parking lot, if you were still using the network at your work, you may still be in violation of work policies. It's important for clients to be aware of and they can make their own decisions. We need to tell them about the risks and benefits of, of engaging in the use of distance counseling, technology, and or social media. We need to address the possibility of technology failure and alternate methods of service de delivery. This does happen. If the towers go down and you lose internet, it may only happen once every two years, but it seems like when it does, it's gonna happen when you've got a full day's worth of e-therapy clients booked. That's been my experience. I know that's superstitious thinking, but it does seem to happen at some of the most inconvenient times. So if that happens for you or for your client, your client's internet may, may go out. What is an alternate method of communication? Generally, the old fashioned phone is the best way to, is the best backup because at least you're getting um, the verbal communication. You're able to hear their voice. You need to have emergency procedures to follow when the counselor is not available. Just because it's e-therapy doesn't mean you as the clinician are available 24-7, 365. That's not reasonable. So just like in face-to-face -face IRL counseling, what procedures does the person follow if they are in crisis when you are not available or outside of business hours, how are they supposed to proceed? You do need to let them know about the possible denial of insurance benefits. Many states have started requiring insurance to reimburse for virtual services, but not all. And not all insurances uh, will do it. In, in states where it's an option, some insurances may opt out of it. We need to let people know about the possibility and help them figure out how to make the best choice. Are they going to start with us and just kind of roll the dice and hope their insurance covers it? Uh, and if their insurance doesn't cover it, what are their options? Part of the informed consent, but I usually have it as an entirely separate document, is the emergency safety plan. Now remember, when you're dealing with people who are um, in distress, and or maybe suicidal, the no harm plan or the suicide prevention plan, whatever you call it, where you're from, they found that it's really usually not worth the paper that's written on. Uh, so having them sign a contract that says, I agree that I will not harm myself really doesn't do a whole lot of good. Cause when they're in distress, when they're hurting, they're not thinking, Ooh, well, what if I break that? What if I violate that contract? It doesn't happen. It is important to have an emergency safety plan though. What is the number and address of the local hospital and detoxification unit? Identify, actually spell out a description of the conditions in which the client will seek emergency services instead of calling the counselor. What do they need to do? For example, if you're in um, substance abuse, a substance abuse counselor, 
you may tell people that if they are intoxicated they need to go to detox not call you um, or if they are intoxicated at a certain level they need to go to detox first and get clean before they call you you need to identify a local therapist a person who's a therapist who is in that person's local area to whom the client can be referred if e-therapy services are no longer appropriate you can go online uh, psychology today has that therapist locator there are a couple other databases of therapist locators or the person can call their insurance company and find out about uh, providers in their area who are paneled and identify this is the person I will call if things with you in e-therapy aren't working out or I can't attend e-therapy anymore this is the local person that I will reach out to identify three people the person can call in the event of an emergency and have releases of information for emergency contacts and the client's physician or psychiatrist and under what circumstances it would happen where you might reach out to their emergency contacts another thing that I like to have on that emergency plan I find it very helpful is have the person identify what often triggers decompensation and what they can do to mitigate it as well as when I am in crisis it is helpful to and have them list the things that are helpful and when I am in crisis it is not helpful to and have those things listed so we have a better idea when this person is in an emotionally charged vulnerable state what things are more likely to worsen the situation and what things are more likely to help them recording sessions if you are going to record a session it requires informed consent from the patient because you are recording uh, protected health information even if you only plan on using it for your own self supervision it's ethical to let them know ahead of time that you're recording it make sure that wherever you're recording it to is HIPAA and high tech compliant if you're recording it to your local local computer your local hard drive it has full disk encryption if you're recording it please don't to a cloud-based service they need to be HIPAA compliant um, and and having things backed up in the cloud just has its own whole other set of issues as far as HIPAA is concerned you can use when you record sessions you can use them with the patient to review a session and practice new skills so you may be able to go back over a session after the session's over and identify points when the person was using cognitive distortions or extreme language or when their nonverbals became very closed off and you may be able to go back and explore that with the person in the next session and say okay what were what were you communicating here or what was going through your mind at this point as I said recordings are great for self-supervision you can look back and go "Ooh, I really missed the boat on that one or even notice yourself if your nonverbals start communicating that you are getting distracted or your mind is wandering it cannot underscore cannot be used as a replacement for written documentation matter of fact it can be um, dangerous to store video recordings with clients for a long period of time because it's possible just like progress notes theoretically can be subpoenaed video recordings theoretically can be subpoenaed do you want that information to be played before a court and and so it's really important to recognize how uh, the limits of confidentiality and how that might impact the therapeutic relationship text-based counseling there are significant benefits to expressing feelings and thoughts in a text format at a distance outside a face-to-face -face encounter 
Clients can compose thoughts, review the text, revise if desi desired, and pause between writing and sending messages. It doesn't disappear like a thought does. It's right there and they can look at it and go, is this really what I'm wanting to say? And parts of the conversation can be reviewed with the client. You can go back through and highlight parts and go, what was it that you were trying to communicate here? Or this is what I understood. Can you um, clarify for me? In terms of dangers and considerations, in text-based counseling, clients may express an imminent threat of harm, which may not get responded to in a timely fashion. If they send you an email, or even if they send a text message, maybe you're in another session, or you don't have your phone with you because you're out hiking with your family for the afternoon, um, then they may uh, not get a, a prompt response. Now, obviously you've told them that it is not appropriate to communicate with you when they're in crisis that way. You've indicated that when they're in crisis, this is what they're supposed to do. Doesn't mean they're always going to do it. In forums in which comments are not held for moderation, someone may post something inappropriate which can trigger another client. Even if it's HIPAA compliant and moderated, if comments are allowed to go out before the moderator gets to look at them, uh, it can be triggering to other people. Text-based counts uh, things, whether it's on a mobile device or on a desktop, can be screen captured and shared. We see that happening with tweets all the time. And unfortunately, even with tracking IP addresses, a lot of people don't have a stable IP. It's virtually impossible to know with certainty who typed any particular entry. Even if, you're, if you are in an active chat with someone, if they set down their phone, that whole conversation may be readable by an unintended third party. How many times have you sat down your phone and your kid came along and picked it up and just started, you know, being nosy? Text message apps may be set up by default to provide the person push notifications, which can be seen by anybody near the phone. If they're having lunch with their boss and they have their phone face side up and they get a push notification that they've got a therapy appointment at two, that's a violation. Without clearly defined boundaries, text messaging options can be abused by some clients, possibly creating dependency issues. So if you say, here's my text, text address, you can text me anytime during business hours, you may end up with a client who's texting you 15, 20, 30 times a day. In forums that are secure and moderated on your website, you know, that's one option as a technique. You can also have forums that are secure and unmoderated on your website. It's a technique, but it is not advisable because it can be triggering to others. People can say, um, things that are not appropriate for that setting. If they're insecure and moderated or insecure and, other mod and unmoderated on someone else's website, there are a lot of open forums out there right now. Think Quora, for example. Is that something you really want to refer your client to? And you can link to resources and forums or things that you think are helpful from your website. So your website can serve as sort of a therapist extender where there are links that people can click on that take them to websites that you have vetted to make sure that they are providing quality, safe information. In terms of a HIPAA risk assessment, identify the protected health information that your organization creates, receives, stores, and transmits. And you need to identify the human, natural, and environmental threats to the integrity of PHI. Integrity of PHI is not only a breach by somebody else reading it, it can be breached or d disrupted because somebody um, uh, because your, your hard drive crashes and you lose the <clears throat> and you lose the information 
or because the server that you had it on crashes. So there are a lot of threats or maybe your server room floods. I've actually had that happen at one of the agencies that I worked for and we lost everything that was on all of those servers. Assess what measures are in place to protect against threats to the integrity of the health information and the likelihood of areas <clears throat> where a breach can be reasonably anticipated. Determine the potential impact of a PHI breach and assign each potential occurrence a risk level based on the average of the assigned likelihood and impact. So if something is really likely to occur, but it's only going to have a minor impact versus something that is not likely to occur, but if it does, you're going to lose seven years worth of client health information. You can see which one's probably going to be higher on the risk threat assessment. Document your findings and implement measures, procedures, and policies where necessary to ensure HIPAA compliance and keep all documents for at least five years. Some states say seven years, so you need to check with your state regulations. All business associates must provide a signed business associate agreement, not just say, hey, we're HIPAA compliant, but they have to provide you with a hard copy business associate agreement. Use password protection programs like LastPass or some other password vault. Make sure all of your passwords are strong. They use numeric, alphanumeric, lower and upper, uppercase let characters. Have automatic, automatic screen savers or lock screens. And yes, it's a pain in the butt if your screen locks after 60 seconds, but it is important. So if you get up to go make coffee and you forget to lock your screen, then there's only a 60 second window between when you leave your office and when the, the computer locks. Store your password in an online password vault. So in the event of illness, a colleague could be provided with instructions on how to access the stored data. Pay attention to network firewalls. Whenever you retire a computer, use wiping software. Don't just delete it. There's special wiping software to use to clear your uh, hard drive of any um, remnants of protected health information. Document how you've encrypted everything and use full disk encryption on your computer. Also recognize if you print anything out, printers often have a memory that will store maybe the last two or three print jobs. And if that is not encrypted or if that is in a insecure location, that's potentially a HIPAA violation. In terms of disaster planning, make redundant backups of data that can be implemented rapidly. So you have stuff backed up on your computer and at least nightly, it should probably back up to a server and ideally back up to another server that is in a different location. That way, if your building for some reason, heaven forbid, gets taken out by a tornado, there is a backup of your data somewhere. You should have a backup plan for appointments. Should you or the patient be able to unaccess, be unable to access a computer? Have an alternate therapist in the event that you, the clinician, are incapacitated. And it can happen really fast. So make sure that you've got a backup in case your client is in crisis and you are for some reason incapacitated. Have a plan for acquiring new computers should your computer die. If you're providing e-therapy, it's really important that you have a backup computer that you can deploy same day, ideally. And a plan for notification of clients in the event of a data breach. In terms of confidentiality, e-therapy must be done in a private office or room, not in your living room or in front of what I call a trafficked window. At my house, my living room is on the second floor. So the only thing going behind me um, in, front of the, in front of the windows are the birds. However, at the office here, my window is on the first floor and it is not uncommon for people to walk past my window. And I wouldn't want to be doing a video chat with somebody and have 
you know, somebody else walk past the window and go, oh, hey, I know Jim Bob. Uh, so you do want to make sure that you're respecting privacy and who can see what's on your computer. E-therapy must be conducted on a computer with a full hard drive encryption and specially wiped when put out of services. I know I already said it, but it was worth repeating. E-therapy clients must have some means to verify their identity to you each session. With video chat, that's easy. You're seeing their happy face. If it is text, if it is phone, if it is email, you can't assume that because it came from their phone number or from their email that they're the one that actually wrote it. So it is very important to have some sort of code word or something in order to be able to verify it's them. If you're initiating communications with a client, you must use a secure format. If they indicate after that initial connection that they will waive their uh, requirement of a secure format, document it. And then if you're comfortable using it, then, then you can choose to do that. It's important to remember that even if you email a client and you don't put any PHI in it, if you email a client from like Dr. Snipes at DocSnipes.com, it pops up in their email box. Anybody who looks in their email box knows that they're getting a email from you, which is a breach of confidentiality. It's easier than ever to get your contact information and just show up at your door or call your phone at all hours of the night. So it's important to set clear boundaries and be careful how much you use geolocation and check-ins on social media. In terms of dual relationships, clients will research you. Even if you tell them it's not appropriate, they're going to do it. Make sure anything that is publicly viewable is something that you're okay with them seeing and never friend clients on your personal social media pages. Common violations, and I know we're running short of time here, so I'm just going to fly through these because they're pretty much recapitulations of things we've already talked about. Inattention during a session, whether it's because you're bored or you've got IMs coming up on your phone and you keep wanting to check them, or your kids are running around outside or your cat is crawling over top of your computer, that's, that's not really great. That's not really great uh, ethically um, for showing professionalism towards the client. If there's a lack of confidentiality or boundary violations, obviously those are big ethical issues. Not following HIPAA and high tech guidelines for email or calendar software or any other technology that you use could actually end up getting you fined pretty significantly. Working on a computer without hold drive encryption, engaging in e-therapy without understanding the language and norms. Do you know what each particular little emoji means? And I know there are lots of uh, memes out there about people using different emojis, not really realizing what they actually mean. Uh, using non-secure technology like Second Life to for therapy. Unlicensed practice, and this includes international, and I've seen a significant uptick in this in the past three years where these services have come online that recruit therapists to provide services, but they don't do a good job, especially the ones that are based overseas, they don't do a good job of making sure that they are connecting a therapist with a client in a location where the therapist is licensed. Failure to plan for power or internet outages, failure to develop safety plan and referral sources, failure to learn the language of the internet, <clears throat> treating patients who would by common professional standards need, or need a higher level of face-to-face -face care, another common violation, <clears throat> failure to provide normal paperwork such as intake, treatment plan, informed consent, including the upgraded e-therapy informed consent, and HIPAA notifications. Just because it's virtual doesn't mean they don't have to go through all these and sign them with DocuSign or print them out and snail mail them back to you. Failure to verify identity of the consumer every single time, especially for phone and text-based approaches. 
effective techniques. You can use a lot of different audio or video recordings for psychoeducation. This is how you do this particular CBT technique, or this is how you engage in square breathing. Okay, those are great. Paper pencil workbooks or secure fillable PDFs. Those can be used for between session assignments. Secure HIPAA compliant group text or video chat. If you're doing anything in a group, you need to recognize that again, anybody in that group can screen capture and share anything. They're not supposed to, but they might. Self-directed and self-help apps. There's a lot of them out there. There's an app for just about anything. Online journaling, blogging, or vlogging on HIPAA compliant sites or directly to their hard drive. Use of computer games to help with anxiety. For instance, using a flying game to help people reduce a fear of flying. Using virtual reality for rehearsal and exposure therapy with caveats. Um, it's important, BR for rehearsal. If you are using virtual reality to help somebody practice introducing themselves or public speaking, that's one thing. If you're using it for exposure therapy, then you need to have a safety plan and you need to be properly trained in exposure therapy, especially if you're doing VR at a distance. If you're doing VR in your office, then you've got a little bit more control of the situation. Cartoon strips made using PC-based digital art programs. There are some out there, and I call them cartoons, graphic novels, whatever term that people use. Um, collages that are made in graphics programs like Canva that are downloaded and shared via screen sharing. Obviously, these collages, you're not going to want to have them putting any PHI there. Maybe you have them create a collage of what um, happiness looks like to them. You know, that wouldn't be communicating necessarily any PHI. Art projects the client does offline that are photographed and sent via secure email. Or data from fitness tractors or other health or mental health related apps that's transmitted securely. So you can see their body battery or you can see their heart rate when they're practicing deep breathing and biofeedback. Service option examples. I am not endorsing any of these. I'm just giving you examples. HIPAA compliant texting includes Tiger Connect, OMD, Halo Health, and Spock. HIPAA compliant video includes VC, DoxyMe, Zoom, and Theralink. Remember, many of these services have non-HIPAA compliant options and HIPAA compliant options, which cost more money. Um, you must use the HIPAA compliant options. If they claim to be HIPAA compliant but won't sign a business associate agreement, you're not in compliance. It's also important to consider solutions uh, that are all in one. So a client is a one-stop shop. They can schedule their appointment, they can pay, and they can do the video chat all on the same website and they're not having to go hither and yon. Online therapy is becoming increasingly mainstream. There are many advantages such as convenience, cost effectiveness, and accessibility. Things to consider when choosing an office um, are your particular skill set, your target population, how tech savvy you are, and how much you want to spend. So if you're, when I say choosing an office, I mean choosing a virtual office. Building an online practice is no faster than a face-to-face -face one, unfortunately. But there are things you can do to speed up the process, such as maintaining a high degree of ethics, reaching out to populations that are more likely to embrace e-therapy, and making sure to get listed in various online directories. Hope this has given giving you something to chew on in terms of the ethical provision of e-therapy services.